Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining Munich Dialogues on Democracy tonight. My name is Bartley Grosser Richter, and we are a joint venture between the Yale Club of Germany and Munich's America House. So, welcome to the Munich Dialogues community, to the network of Yale alumni in Germany, across Europe, and around the globe, as well as to our America House partners. In addition, tonight's program is a joint event with the German Canadian Association. It grew out of a meeting with their vice president, Dr. Georg Schmitz, and our co-moderator tonight, David Eyinger, who got in touch with me earlier this year about an article that was going viral, not only in the Canadian community, but all over the English speaking world. In the Globe and the Mail, Professor Thomas Homer Dixon wrote that Canada's big, huge neighbor to the South seems to be becoming increasingly ungovernable and that he sees uh, a risk for civil war. He asked many other questions, among them how Canada should prepare. And so I would like to give a warm welcome to the Deutsch Kanadische community and thank you for partnering with us tonight to explore these issues. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to a conversation with Professor Thomas Homer Dixon. He's the founder and director of the Cascade Institute, a Canadian research center addressing the full range of humanities converging environmental, economic, political, technological and health crises. He's an award-winning author of important works like his book, The Ingenuity Gap, How We Can Solve the Problems of the Future, or The Upside of Down, Catastrophe, Creativity and the Renewal of Civilization. And his most recent is Commanding Hope, The Power We Have to Renew a World in Peril. And that will help frame our conversation tonight. So in addition to his sharp analysis of the political situation in the United States going into the midterm elections, his latest articles have been about the risk of nuclear weapons in the Ukraine war, and of course, climate change. From a review of Commanding Hope, I would like to quote, Homer Dixon describes himself as a complexity scientist. He's been studying the interplay between environmental collapse and the society and society for decades, always with an eye for solutions that brings a rare note of optimism to an undeniably bleak subject. So it's not gonna be all negative, hopefully. After the talk, David Anger will join to co-moderate the Q&A. David is a retired Canadian diplomat and an international lawyer and a member of the Deutsche Kanadische Gesellschaft. During his career with Canadian public service, he specialized in public international law and he served at the Canadian diplomatic missions in Geneva, Washington, Berlin, and Madrid. He now lives in Munich and I am honored to call him a friend. If you would like to ask questions tonight, as always, you can submit them via email to event at americahouse.de. That's the German spelling, A-M-E-R-I-K-A-H-A-U-S dot D-E, or through the YouTube chat function on next to the screen on your computer. And if you would like to share the evening with others, the last thing I wanted to say is that link will stay up and you can share it for people who can't be with here with us now, or if you want to watch it again. So with that, I'll turn the screen over to Professor Homer Dixon and say welcome to Munich Dialogues. Hello there. Well, it's delightful to talk to you this evening, your time, morning, my time. I just uh, finished breakfast. I'm speaking from the west coast of North America, uh, Vancouver Island, for those of you familiar with the west coast of Canada, uh, Southern Vancouver Island. Uh, I'm at a, a university, a small university called Royal Roads University that's on the, the coast of Vancouver Island, looking across Juan de Fuca Strait towards uh, Washington State and the Olympic Mountains. It's a truly wonderful natural environment here and uh, a place where people come to reflect on the state of the world uh, and within the Cascade Institute, which we founded here at Royal Roads University, we are uh, examining the greatest challenges humanity faces as well as opportunities for addressing those challenges effectively. I'll talk a little bit more about the Cascade Institute later, but the main topic today is the topic of hope. Um, I, we could talk about the decline of democracy in the United States, and I'll say a few words about that. We could talk about specific challenges such as climate or the crisis of the war in Eastern Europe right at the moment. But I want to talk about, more importantly, I think a larger issue that we're all struggling with, which is how one sustains hope in a, a world circumstance that seems at some, sometimes truly bleak and doesn't seem to offer much 
opportunity for any emotional response except despair. So I'm going to outline the, the basic premises of my argument in my book, Commanding Hope, which Bartley uh, showed you just a moment ago. And I think we can begin by bringing up my slides, which I'll do now. So this is the book, uh, Commanding Hope, The Power We Have to Renew a World in Peril. It was published in uh, 2020, uh, right in the midst of the pandemic, uh, which was a challenging time to bring out a book, needless to say. Um, but it reflects my thinking on the state of the world and uh, opportunities for moving in a positive direction as a species, thinking that is de has developed over a period of a number of decades. Now, this is the third of three books I intended to write, kind of a trilogy, I guess you could say, going back to the first that Bartley mentioned, The Ingenuity Gap, which was published in, 20, in, in the year 2000, uh, The Upside of Down in 2006. Both of those books were substantially descriptive, whereas this book is much more prescriptive. It's an attempt to actually point us forward to possibilities for positive outcomes and how we can build our hope around those possibilities. But needless to say, it's a remarkably challenging time and I'm trying to change my slides here and finding, there we go. Uh, we all are aware of the multitude of crises that seem, seem to be, seems to be developing around the world, the war, uh, wildfires caused uh, substantially by climate change. This is in British Columbia, but we're seeing these, of course, all over the world. Southern Europe this summer, for example. Uh, extraordinary pollution events. Uh, refugee crises, the planet over. The largest movements of refugees and migrants ever recorded by the United Nations. Uh, increasing political polarization and radicalization, especially within Western societies. Uh, deep divisions around equity, uh, racial justice, and otherwise within Western societies producing sometimes widespread civil instability. And of course, the pandemic, which is still with us now and may return with vigor at some point in the future, but has produced a fundamental shift in the trajectory of the world economy. And I think in many respects, more broadly, human civilization. We could call this challenge a global polycrisis, and that's the way we're now labeling it within the Cascade Institute. Uh, the Cascade Institute is fundamentally dedicated to trying to understand cascades of changes within the, uh, within the integrated global systems, economic, social, political, technological, and otherwise, uh, how, uh, one crisis can interact with other crises to produce knock-on effects that spread around the planet. We're also interested in identifying leverage points, possibilities for leveraging those nonlinear phenomena, those that capacity for the global system to flip from one state to another in a positive direction to produce virtuous cascades, not just pernicious or negative, harmful cascades of change. One of the things that we've noted in the Cascade Institute is that these crises that I just mentioned, and there are more, of course, that I didn't mention, that are developing at the global level, seem to be all reaching a kind of critical point simultaneously. And we argue that there are some kinds of synchronization effects, that there are largely unseen connections causal connections between these crises that are causing them to reinforce each other. So everything is going critical simultaneously. And it's this idea of synchronization across crises, geopolitical in terms of the war, climate, economic, de democratic decline and the like, that is at the core of our research program now, at least when it comes to pernicious cascades at the Cascade Institute. And this environment of crisis, the global poly crisis, whether it's recognized as an integrated set of crises or not, people, uh, feel the effects in their everyday lives in terms of economic insecurity. Uh, they may uh, see or experience large flows 
of uh, migration uh, and, and see the social consequences of those. They see the smoke that sweeps across the sky from wildfires, uh, but just a general sense of that, that the world that they have known is no longer stable and secure, uh, and uh, the future is profoundly uncertain. And this is, of course, conducive to the emotion fear. And I would say that in many respects, fear is the dominant emotion of our age. And that provides opportunities for certain individuals to build their political power around the anger and fear that are becoming more widespread, use those emotions to divide our populations, to try to identify out groups, uh, enemy groups who are responsible, uh, they say, for the, uh, the, the crises and insecurity that people are experiencing, and, uh, and build their political power uh, on those divisions and on the anger and fear that those divisions engender. So when we look to the future, and I should say that I wrote this book, Commanding Hope, for my children principally. Uh, Sarah and I have uh, a boy, Ben, who's now 17, and a, a girl, now a young woman, Kate, who is uh, 14. Uh, and, uh, and I wrote the book during the during the period that they were growing up, it took me eight years to write. And the book actually starts with a vignette uh, about my daughter finding an academic article and asking her mother about it uh, when she was four years old. And fundamentally, I was asking the question, what is the story we're going to tell our children about the future they will inherit? And what are the possibilities for hope within that future, uh, given the extraordinary challenges that our species is facing? And is this the story that our children will be told and they'll come to come to believe that we're all members of the failed species and during this century we're destined to bear witness to the devastation of our planetary home and the violent unraveling of much of what we've accomplished as a species through the millennia and this is an unacceptable narrative it's an unacceptable story i think we'd all agree this is the last thing that we want our children to come to believe i have to say though that increasingly young people are, are adopting a kind of frame of this kind or a paradigm of this kind in their minds. Yeah, I think when you teach young people now, when you get into a conversation about their sense for their prospects for the future, they increasingly, to use the vernacular, say, well, we're fucked. There's nothing we can do. I, we, I, I, you know, they'll say things like, like I don't believe that that uh, I'm going to live out my full natural life because all of these crises will, will produce some kind of catastrophe that will kill me at some point in the future. Whether these attitudes are reasonable or not is an open question, but that is the kind of deep, profound pessimism that's leading to a, a, a rapid increase in anxiety and psychological problems like depression among our young people. So this is, we have to find an alternative, another pathway, psychological and otherwise. And I argue in the book, that hope is the key. If we lose hope, we are lost. Among other things, if we lose hope, then we lose our agency. Any possibility of motivation to work to try to improve the situation we, we're in. Now, there's a substantial debate, and I'll allude to it in just a moment, about the value of hope, whether it's a productive emotion or not. I make my claim strongly and early on in the book that it is an essential psychological uh, 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 tool or foundation for our psychological well-being as individuals. And in fact, when you talk to young people, for instance, like when we talk to Ben and Kate about the challenges that they face, we don't spend a lot of time talking about the world crisis, the poly crisis within our family, but they hear about things and they raise issues and conversations around the dinner table. And when they say, when they start to slide in that direction of of despair, the first thing you do as a parent is you say, but there are things you can do. It's not hopeless. There are possibilities, positive possibilities in the future. We reach for hope automatically when we try to comfort and counsel others who are sliding towards despair. And, uh, and, and so that's just evidence that 
we shouldn't jettison it. We can't disparage it. We have to make it work for us. But hope is complex. And I try to unpack it in some detail in the book. The common criticisms by those who want to jettison hope is that hope is false because it leads us to misestimate the probabilities of positive outcomes, so overemphasize the possibilities of positive outcomes in the future. Uh, that it's naive, that it grounds us in uh, overly optimistic views of what is possible, the same in some sense quite similar to the notion of false hope, and that it's passive, that, it's, that it undermines our agency and our sense of, of possibility for making the world better and for changing things positively. And in Commanding Hope, I take each one of these criticisms and I respond very directly by proposing an alternative characteristic. So Commanding Hope is a particular notion of hope. So I build a theory of hope and a concept of hope to try to turn it into a muscular emotion uh, and reimagine it in a way that can, that can uh, help us in a positive way in seeing pathways forward in the future. The, the title Commanding Hope is intentionally a double entendre. It's intentionally, it intentionally carries two meanings. There's this idea that this is a notion of hope that commands our attention because it's a powerful notion of hope. But there's also embedded in the title the idea that hope is an emotion that we can command in the sense that we can make it do our bidding. We can shape it to make it into an emotion that is powerful and useful for us. And so those, those two ideas about the notion of hope that I'm trying to build weave themselves all the way through the book. So I first of all argue that hope has to be honest. It, it can't be grounded in a misestimation of possibilities and probabilities in the future. We have to be brutally frank and scientifically realistic about the nature of the challenges we face. So that's honest hope. Uh, it has to be astute. In particular, it, it, it can't have a naive set, based on a naive set of assumptions about, about uh, the nature of the challenges we face and the individuals and groups that we are dealing with in trying to make the world a better place. And I spend quite a bit of time at the end of the book building this concept of astute hope, which is grounded in a deep understanding of the worldviews and perspectives of the other groups that we're working with or struggling against in trying to make the world a better place. So this is astute. So you might call it strategically astute. You have to have a sense for the landscape you're operating in socially and politically and otherwise, and how to maneuver and operate within that landscape to try to get to the better world that you want to achieve. And then finally, hope has to be powerful. It needs to engage our agency. It needs to give us motivation to actually change things in a positive way. And the best way of doing that is by having a very clear vision and view of the future that you want to achieve. So in the, in the literature about hope, there are two fundamental, there's sort of a dividing point uh, in the theoretical and scholarly literature about hope, the philosophical literature about hope, there's sort of a division of hope into two categories. One is a, a notion of hope that's dispositional. It's sort of, you might call it a kind of uh, general sense that things will probably turn out okay uh, without a specific image of what uh, okay means. You might think that it's kind of an optimistic disposition. Uh, and sometimes for that reason, hope is confused with optimism. And then there's an, another notion of hope, which is the one that I ground my book in, which is a uh, notion of, of in, intentional hope, not dispositional, but intentional. This is a, a, a kind of hope that is, that is focused on achieving a particular outcome. It's an attitude towards a vision or a view of the future that we hope or that we want, that we, that we desire to come to to pass. So this um, intentional hope is focused on an object. It's focused on a vision of the future or a mental image of the future that, uh, that we hope to achieve. And that directs our agency and directs our motivation towards, uh, towards working to, to that goal. And there's a kind of a distinction here that I allude to in the book between 
the locution hope that and the locution hope to. The locution hope that, I hope that it'll be a sunny day tomorrow, uh, is very passive. It, I have a vision of what a nice world would be like, but there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, and, and so it's very passive and it denies our agency. I hope to uh, uh, help my community be resilient in the face of climate change is, uh, is a locution that emphasizes agency and what we can do to make the world a better place and to get to that world that I envision as an object of my hope. And so the kind of hope that I argue for in commanding hope is very much a hope to, as opposed to a hope that kind of hope. Every time you say hope to, it's followed by a verb. I hope to, uh, I hope to build resiliency in my community. I hope to uh, uh, be kinder to my, to my children. In each case, there's a verb that suggests that I am an actor and I am an agent in the situation. So these three notions of our components of commanding hope uh, are elaborated in the book, Honest Hope, Astute Hope, and Powerful Hope at some length. Let me just unpack a couple of ideas a bit further and then we can move on to our conversation. <clears throat> There's a deep tension between hope and honesty. This is the issue of honest hope, the first of those three components, especially in dangerous times, and we leave, live in dangerous times right now. Let's take the question of whether we can achieve a cap to global warming of two degrees Celsius. On the one hand, changes that would be enough to make a real difference and, uh, and keep us to two degrees Celsius warming aren't politically, socially, economically, and, and technologically feasible. On the other hand, those changes that we are implementing to cap warming at two degrees Celsius, they may be feasible, but they won't be enough to actually uh, limit the warming to that level. And this is what I call the enough versus feasible dilemma. And it's an argument that weaves its way through the book. And one of the reasons that we are not being honest about, for instance, the climate change problem is that we haven't recognized the profound intractability of the enough versus feasible dilemma. That what is enough to keep us to two degrees isn't feasible politically, socially, technologically, and the like. And what is feasible politically, socially, and technologically isn't getting us anywhere clear to close to enough. This idea is sort of illustrated uh, <clears throat> humorously in this little cartoon. The woman is looking outside her door, which is on fire. And she says, so apparently changing to energy efficient light bulbs wasn't enough to stop the climate change problem. I don't think there's a wide recognition of just where we're going when it comes to global warming. Uh, people realize the problem is serious, but I don't think there's a wide recognition of just how extraordinarily serious it is and how far off the mark we are from getting this thing under control. This is a representation of global tropospheric temperatures going back to the end of the last ice age, 11,300 years before the present. It's formalized to zero degrees Celsius, just so you can see the, the, the trends a little bit more clearly. The zero degrees represents uh, actually about 13.6 degrees Celsius average temperature in the troposphere around the world. Uh, and you can see that over that period of 11,300 years, uh, temperatures have varied about 0 0.7 degrees Celsius. And in the last 2000 years on the right hand side, during the, during the period in which human civilization was built, essentially where we laid down our major cities, our agricultural regions, our irrigation systems, our port cities, our transportation networks and the like, uh, the temperature varied about 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. It was in a period of remarkable climate stability on the planet. And we are now well outside that envelope and we are heading much further out that's outside that envelope without radical changes in, uh, in uh, carbon emissions in the atmosphere. So we need to, in the face of challenges like this, we need to move from a hope that we're going to stop this problem to a hope too. And of course, many people around the world are engaged in countless important activities and actions to try to reverse the climate problem or at least slow it 
and to reduce carbon emissions from, uh, from our economy and from our personal and national activities. And I, I don't spend time in the book in getting into, getting into all the details of those kinds of responses because other people have done that uh, in great detail. And I think, I, think it's, uh, I think they're all very important. I do argue that we must get much more radical in our restructuring our, of our national and global economy, especially when it comes to the issue of economic growth <clears throat> and how we're going to uh, sustain people's well-being on this planet when we're actually ramping down material and energy consumption as we have to, if we're going to deal with the climate change problem. Instead, I focus on uh, what kind of object we should have for our hope, assuming that we can put together the technological and institutional components of a desirable future. How should we structure that in terms of principles and the beliefs and the moral commitments we have uh, as we try to depict this, this vision of the future that's going to be an object of our hope. And I, I suggest that at the very least, we should commit ourselves to three uh, fundamental injunctions. We don't wreck our planetary home. We don't commit mass suicide by fighting among ourselves and that we protect our children. And I suggest that you can probably achieve very substantial agreement among humanity in its entirety around these three principles, these three injunctions. But they aren't uh, emotionally powerful in a way that could really galvanize people to work together to build a more humane global civilization. They are, uh, the first two are, are negative injunctions, uh, telling us that we shouldn't do things that we're in the process of doing. Uh, and the third, uh, you know, might some people might argue that the best way we can protect our children is protect, protecting our children from other people's children or from other societies. So it's not entirely clear that the injunction protect our children is going to lead to unity within humanity. It might actually encourage division. So whereas these are uh, a useful starting point for thinking about what our vision of the future might be, they are an absolute minimum baseline and we need more in terms of articulating uh, what our object of hope of our hope should be. And in the last part of the book, I emphasize what I call are the most important principles that should guide our vision of the future. And these are security, opportunity, justice, and identity. And I speak about each of these four uh, principles in considerable detail. And I argue that uh, that there are uh, fundamental temperamental differences within humanity, which in a very crude sense, you can distinguish between three fundamental human temperaments, people who are prudential, who are concerned about uh, insecurity and want safety, people who are exuberant in their temperament and uh, are uh, excited about the possibility of exercising their agency, and then people who are fundamentally empathetic in their temperament, who are concerned about the well-being of other human beings and feel for their suffering and are profoundly interested in, in improving other people's well-being. Now, to a certain extent, all of us have at least uh, some element of each of these temperaments in our personality, but I do think that, that uh, individuals tend to be biased towards one or the other that some of us are more prudential and some of us are more exuberant and some of us are more empathetic than the other two categories. This very crude uh, template of temperaments suggests that if we really want to build an object for our hope, a vision of, the, of our future global society that will appeal to a broad swath of human beings, it needs to appeal to each one of the security, opportunity and justice principles. And what we find in the world today is that the ideologies that are proposed and propagated by individuals who are leaders tend to emphasize one or two of these, not all three simultaneously. Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump, for instance, would uh, strongly emphasize the security principle. Uh, 
Others towards the left of the political spectrum in Western societies would emphasize the, the justice principle, for instance. And there tends to be a, a, a lack of convergence of vision around a set of principles that will bring everybody together in a common project. And then finally, this, this principle of identity is, uh, is grounded in an observation that, uh, that I've had uh, going back over many years studying societies around the world. If I were asked to identify one characteristic of societies that uh, uh, is perhaps the most important in determining whether they are successful or not, whether they can solve their problems. It's, I would say that it, it's whether the individuals in the society from the highest levels of the, of the elites to all the way down to the lowest socioeconomic levels in the society, whether they share a common commitment to the common wheel, a sense of responsibility to the well-being of the whole population, the whole society whether there is, uh, to use that wonderful French expression, a, a sense of a projet de société, a, a common project for the society that brings everybody together around some superordinate goals and encourages a sense of identity that's encompassing uh, uh, as, as the population, as the society as a whole moves forward. Uh, and I, I, I argue strongly within the book that we need to develop this kind of sense of common fate, a sense of projet de societe, a commitment to, uh, uh, to superordinate goals at the global level that at least a portion of human society needs to recognize the, the fact that we are in this global poly crisis together and we're not going to solve these problems unless we collaborate and cooperate as a species and we share a common sense of identity, a species-wide sense of we-ness, if you want to call it that. <clears throat> so just in the last part of my talk, last couple of minutes, I want to remark on why I think that we are in an, an unprecedented situation today on the planet in terms of human civilization that could produce outcomes that are very different from anything we've seen before in the evolution of human society. And fundamentally, it's because of three, these, three, uh, these three characteristics that are on this screen here. Uh, first of all, a broadening awareness of common fate when it comes to problems like climate change or uh, novel zoonotic diseases uh, such as uh, COVID-19 that we can, we, we are not going to solve these problems effectively or even at all if we address them uh, through our individual groups, the actions of our individual nations and groups, but that we have to pull together effectively as a species if we're going to deal with them. So there's this spreading awareness of common fate on the planet, whether it's broadly shared or not is still very much open to be decided. Uh, we have extraordinary levels of connectivity on the planet. Uh, that's widely understood now. But something that's less widely recognized is that we have scientific knowledge that gives us a very clear and profound uh, scientific understanding of the nature of the challenges we face as compared, for instance, to European, Europeans during the Black Death in uh, the uh, 13th and 14th centuries when people really didn't understand the nature of the plague and uh, what they could do in response. When it comes to a problem like climate change or zoonotic diseases, we, we understand the nature of the challenge, the physical characteristics and biological characteristics of these challenges very, very clearly, and we know what we need to do. So these three conditions, I think, are uh, uh, actually define a, a, a framing for the human situation that's very different from anything that humankind has experienced before. And it creates at least the possibility that we could go to a place that we could arrive at a, outcomes this century that are very different from anything that has happened before. Whether we go there or not uh, is very much an open question whether the outcomes are positive. Because I really think that we're facing two uh, alternative futures, which I define towards the end of the book. 
uh, that are defined in terms of worldviews or belief systems of fear and hope. The first one is the Mad Max worldview. Uh, for those of you who know the Mad Max movies, you are familiar with the way, with the, the, the particular perspective on the world that they elaborate. And then another, which I define as renew the future, which I define in great deal of detail in terms of what that belief system means and how it can be, it help articulate the object of our hope, our vision of the future. Are we going to end up in a Mad Max world? And I define this in terms of these two, these two worldviews and the possibility that uh, we could ultimately evolve this century towards something that we characterize as a second axial age. So some of you are familiar, I'm sure, with the work of the existential philosopher Carl Jaspers. In the 20th century, he noted that between 600 and 200 BCE, five major civilizations in the world all change their fundamental character sim simultaneously. Uh, even without much communication between them, they, they, uh, they all flipped simultaneously during that 400 year period to uh, cosmologies that laid the foundation for modernity. Very different understanding of the natural world, of the relationship between, between uh, uh, individuals and societies and the cosmos and very different fundamental moral premises too that laid the foundations for modernity. And I think the question then is whether we are on the cusp of something similar this century as we move forward into these enormous crises and whether they could galvanize a kind of shift in the fundamental character of human civilization uh, that would be analogous to the first axial age, excuse me. I think I'm going to probably end with this slide because I realize we're getting on and we want to have some time for conversation. But uh, I don't use this this image in uh, in the uh, in the book, but it characterizes, in complex systems terms, the kind of idea that I'm expressing in the last chapter. This this tension between two possible futures: the Mad Max future and the Renew the future worldview and uh, image of the of the future. Uh, this is what complexity scientists would call a uh, energy landscape. The idea is that the system like the world as you see on the left hand side has a, a characteristic of migrating to a low point in the landscape where where it's stable. We're currently in a situation where the poly crisis is bouncing us out of our stability zone on the left-hand side at the front of this three-dimensional space. Uh, and we're going to move up into a period of great instability where it's indeterminate whether we're going to move into a positive future or a negative future. You can think of Mad Max as the situation in the country Haiti right now writ globally. Uh, uh, generalized globally. It, it would be a basin of attraction, as complexity scientists call it, a stability zone that's very powerful. And once we're there, we probably won't be able to get out. Uh, but there is also this possibility of an alternative basin of attraction, alternative future, which, which I label renew the future. To get there, we have to kind of skirt by the Mad Max. Uh, and there's going to be a constant tension or tugging towards Mad Max, which is actually quite close in terms of uh, its, its time in the future. We could be there uh, within 10 years, potentially, if Vladimir Putin decides to use uh, strategic nuclear weapons, we could be there next year. Um, so but renew the future is farther away, but to get there, uh, we have to skirt Mad Max. And once we're there, the basin is less deep. We actually have to work harder to stay there to keep that situation stable. But it's a situation of larger, of greater social cohesion. Of uh, uh, It's a future that is defined by those principles of opportunity, security, justice, and identity that I identify at the end of the book. I think I'm going to end there and see if we can have some few minutes of discussion. There, there are a a number of stories in the book 
that I uh, elaborate personal stories about people who uh, have exhibited the kind of hope that I discuss in the book, in particular, this woman, Stephanie May, who was involved in mobilizing mothers around the world to uh, uh, act against testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, testing of nuclear weapons by Russia and the United States in the 1950s, excuse me, the Soviet Union and the United, United States in the 1950s. And she had an enormous influence on people around the world. Uh, uh, here she is speaking in London's Trafalgar Square. She was American, but she went to London to speak to here 100,000 people in, in London's Trafalgar Square in the early 1960s. And these mothers through their global activities fundamentally shifted the debate about nuclear weapons testing and helped produce the partial test ban treaty that ultimately put test nuclear weapons underground. And that was an example, I think, of the kind of hope that we need and the kind of popular mobilization we need to produce the possibilities of reaching the renew the future as opposed to the Mad Max future that I describe in the last chapter. So I will stop and let's have some conversation. I think I'll jump in here. Uh, my name is David. Uh, we met briefly before this, uh, this meeting. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to say that <clears throat> I'm not feeling particularly optimistic, um, but I would like to ask you a couple of questions that will tie this into the Canadian German uh, context. Um, first one is really a, almost a personal question. You are a Canadian, I'm a Canadian. And um, when I read the book, I sensed, even though you were saying some quite disturbing things all the way through the book, um, there was this core of optimism that I think is, is uh, related to your concept of, of commanding hope. And I'd like to know whether one of the things I, I thought is, you know, this is a book that perhaps would not be written by someone who was not a Canadian. And I'm because there's something in it that I think speaks to, I think, a broad swath of the, the Canadian population. And that's that we tend to be uh, rather glass full people rather than glass half empty people. But having read the book and listened to you this evening, and I, you did mention that it took eight years to write the book. Do you feel less optimistic at this point than when you started writing the book, I guess is my first question. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. <laughs> Are you still there? I'm still there. Yes, you're yeah, talking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not because you just disappeared. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I do. Um, I think the challenges are uh, even more substantial now. I allude to the possibility of nuclear war in the book, um, of course, e even when I, I was in the midst of the major writing period uh, from 2016 or so to 2019, uh, Trump and Putin were rattling their nuclear sabers, uh, North Korea was. Um, there was a very palpable sense that the nuclear risk was escalating but uh, now I think we're in a qualitatively different situation. We really have flipped uh, as a result of this war and as a result of the escalatory rhetoric of Vladimir Putin to a, a, a very different situation. Not one that ultimately we should have probably not expected. I mean, we have a lot of these weapons hanging around and as tensions increase because of these other problems around the planet, one would expect that uh, in a scarcity world, a world characterized by scarcity and a scarcity mindset that leaders will start, uh, one would have expected that leaders would start uh, rattling those nuclear sabers even more or, or uh, uh, threatening to use them and maybe even ultimately using them. I mean, I've been concerned for a long period of time about the possibility that a climate induced shock could produce a nuclear war between Pakistan and India in the, in the uh, subcontinent, for example. Um, but it's different when it's actually starts to be realized in real time. And I have to say it has, it has a profound effect on all of us, I think. It's like we're all turning around and saying, oh, now, what now? 
this this additional thing that's layered on top of everything else. And Europe's about to enter this extraordinary energy crisis and energy challenge this winter. Uh, it's it looks like the the European economy is going to slide into recession. Uh, there it, it, there's a coordinated um, move by central banks to uh, raise interest rates around the world, which is going to have a global recessionary effect. There's some indication that we could even have emerging from China and the property markets in China, uh, major financial crises. So it's like everything is converging simultaneously. So yeah, that, and yet it, it, given the broader perspective that I developed in the book, especially in the middle part of the book, as you've read it, there's sort of this account of the state of the world in the middle part of the book. Um, uh, in some ways, this stuff isn't surprising. Uh, uh, in, in, in many ways, what I say in the middle part of the book is this is what we can expect, and here it is. In fact, um, uh, if you go back and look at the ingenuity gap and the upside of down in my earlier work on environment and conflict back in the 1990s, I've been saying pretty consistently that we're in the 20s, 20s to 2030s that the world was going to hit a wall and that a whole bunch of crises were going to converge simultaneously. And here we are. But it's different when it actually happens and when you've got kids to worry about. So, but it doesn't change my fundamental argument. And, and that's one point that I didn't mention in my presentation that I think is really important is that this world is so complex and so nonlinear now that we actually don't know where it's gonna go. And there are possibilities for positive outcomes such as this kind of flip to alternative worldviews, a renew the future worldview, a kind of axial age transition that would only happen under extreme stress anyway. That and, and given that we are in this kind of sui generis situation of high scientific knowledge, high connectivity, and emerging sense of shared fate, we do know that human beings produce their most remarkable accomplishments when their backs are against the wall. And we also know that there's no such thing consistently as human nature, that we are extraordinarily plastic as a species. And uh, so I, I maintain that possibility there. In some sense, we have to go through this crisis if we're going to learn to live together properly on this on this planet. So this okay. is kind of a necessary condition for, I, for progress. Now I see I just, you, you flipping again to the, the optimistic side. And I think um, what I'd like to now take you to is a slightly more optimistic uh, viewpoint. You basically um, spend some time discussing Stephanie May and her campaign and the fact that this, you know, impossible job was basically done by a lady who had an idea and just mobilized other people. Um, and I, I think I'd like to point to, I mean, uh, in Germany, I was studying in, in England in 1988, and one of the most famous history professors in England at the University of Cambridge um, told us flatly in our class that in our lifetime, the Berlin Wall would never fall. Yes, now, well, there that you go. Was 1988. Um, and 11 years later. No, oh, it was basically it? one year later. <laughs> so, well, 88. Yeah, I thought it was 78. 88. Yes, one year later. Exactly. So yeah. uh, the thing is, you know, and I'm I'm constantly um, um, sort of intrigued by the fact of, and some, it links to something you just said, that sometimes things happen that people aren't expecting to happen. And sometimes those things are not as bad. They're not all bad, the things that happen that we aren't expecting to happen. Um, and um and another so David, I, I want to give you a couple of examples that, yeah. that really recent examples. OK, so so we tend to overdetermine pessimism in some ways in this world between between March 2020 and uh, the first week of March 2020 and the first week of April 2020. Uh, about 50 percent of the world's population locked down. Right. This is probably the most substantial change in human behavior, coordinated human behavior of a proportion of the human population in the history of the species, right? There, there's an example of, of the product of connectivity. And it probably saved hundreds of thousands of lives, maybe millions of lives, right? Between about mid -tw March 2020 and mid April 2020, the concept of social distancing or physical distancing went global and help change people's behavior around the planet. Uh, if you had asked me or you or anybody in January, 2020, what social or physical distancing was, we wouldn't have come up with a good answer. But by April, we knew exactly what it was. And not only that, we were implementing the, the, the procedure. 
Within two days of the Chinese downloading the genetic code for uh, the COVID virus, uh, Pfizer and Moderna had both developed the morphology, molecular morphology for their vaccine. And we had that vaccine out to billions of people, not um, adequately distributed across the, the wealth and population and socioeconomic divides in the, in the world, of course. But nonetheless, we had that vaccine as a species out to billions of people within 18 months. That's extraordinary, right? We have to remember that, that there are these possibilities. At the beginning of the Ukraine war, everybody assumed the Western alliance would shatter, would fragment. And, and yet it, it's almost as if that, that war has been a galvanic moment for the West in recognizing what's at stake and what, what may be lost if Putin is actually succeeds. People weren't expecting that kind of thing. So there are these, these possibilities in what the complexity scientists call the adjacent possible, just beyond the boundary of what we can see, many of which may be opportunities for positive change Part of what the Cascade Institute is in the business of doing is trying to identify those and make them real, pull them across that boundary into, into reality. Thank you. Um, I guess, um, Bartley, I don't know whether you want to jump in at this point. I have one more question relating to your article, uh, States of, um, of Emergency. Um, which got this whole thing started when Georg and I basically read it and took it to Bartley and said, you know, we really should get this guy. Um, the thing is that you did the the article is quite quite interesting, quite disturbing. I think an extremely astute. Uh, estimation of what was going on at the time. However, um, when you come to actually the prescription at the end, it sounds again quite Canadian because it says you know, set up a standing committee. Um, uh, having been a, a, a diplomat in the Canadian Foreign Service and having served in Washington, you know, uh, basically what you were talking about as far as a political process is something that's always been an administrative process, and that is how to deal with the relationship with the United States. Um, and, you know, I would basically say that some of the things that we do is looking at not putting all our eggs in one basket, no matter how big and important that basket is. But maybe just um, briefly, because I know there'll be other people with questions, um, if you could say what you would see as the three concrete measures that Canada can, could possibly take to, I guess, uh, buffer um, ourselves. Yeah, exactly. Buffer ourselves from what might happen south of the border. Mm. Okay. Well, first of all, I wouldn't dismiss the, the importance of setting up some kind of uh, standing committee that provides a public platform for a conversation about this challenge. Um, now, uh, I, I, the, the article was intended as a, an analytical exercise to get the issue in front of people, and I wanted to start a conversation about what should be done. That conversation has not uh, proceeded very far. I was contacted by a few people. Uh, within the parliamentary process, for example, uh, about, about the kind of public conversation. But I think we've sort of slid back into uh, a world of denial about the dangers in the United States. We'll see what happens in these upcoming midterms. Um, the Democrats seem to be in a somewhat stronger position than we thought they would be in January. Um, but there are long-term trends in the United States. There's a very good assessment in the New York Times today of the underlying economic uh, crises affecting uh, especially rural white communities in the United States and how that's driving Trumpism and the kind of divisiveness in the society. So those trends are not going away. So um, I, I think there, uh, I, I think, I don't know if I have three, but we need to, we certainly need to have a public conversation. There are cultural, economic, political implications, political slash security implications to the development of a right-wing regime in the United States for Canada. We are going to be in an extraordinarily difficult situation, especially if the certain parts of the country elect ultimately to uh, secede. For instance, if there's a secessionist party in Alberta that uh, is trying to, uh, is encouraged by uh, a, a Trumpist type movement in the United States to join the United States. I mean, this could be a, a nightmare scenario for the country. Um, at the very least, I think we need to start planning out or gaming uh, maybe some of this publicly and some of it within our security establishment what the implications might be 
and how the country could respond. Um, I think that it's very important that this conversation take place across partisan nature in the country. So as much as possible that we bring in those communities who might uh, who might be inclined to migrate in that direction if they not if they're not if they don't feel they're part of that broader projet de society the societe of, of Canada that broader sense of weeness. Um, the other thing is, and this is a bit more controversial, and John Ibbotson alluded to it in the column that followed mine, uh, is you know there are 300,000 Canadians uh, in the United States, many of whom with a great deal of influence, who may have some soft power capacity. Um, now, that might actually produce a reaction that would be negative for Canada, but there may be ways that Canada can can gently nudge or influence the situation in a positive direction uh, as, as the United States goes through this, uh, this, this period of turmoil. And it's not going to end. I mean, even if the Democrats do reasonably well in the November elections and in the coming presidential election, there is a substantial body of 30 or more percent of the American population that is profoundly aggrieved and doesn't believe in the in the functioning of democracy anymore in the United States. So uh, we have to confront this. So that's two. Yeah. The okay. bottom I, think, line, I think I'll cut you off there because I think we're running out of time and I think Bartley should be coming on to, sure. uh, to wrap this up and perhaps ask the final short snappers. Oh, I've got some questions too. Yes, thank you, David. Um, it, you were moving towards, uh, I have two questions that sort of run together with where you were going. Because in your book, you talk about the concept of we, being imperative problem solving. And you talked about that on a global level for climate change, we all have to sort of identify. Um, but in the US we have implications because Republicans and Democrats don't see a we anymore. Yeah. And so on the back of that, in your book, you talk about two practical tools to help us understand other people's worldviews. And I wonder if you could sort of give this Cliff Notes version of that. <laughs> okay, so in the last two or three minutes. So I intentionally didn't allude to those, Barkley, because it, it involves a, a, large, a longer conversation. But just quickly for the audience, um, I, I suggest that belief system change is a very important intervention point and perhaps the most powerful intervention point to try to move us, nudge us towards renew the future as a way, as opposed to Mad Max. That, and that's why I talk about the worldviews, the respective worldviews of Mad Max and renew the future and that, and that we need to construct these belief systems within people's heads as much as possible that, that lead us in a more positive direction towards those principles of opportunity, security, justice, and identity. Uh, and I offer two tools that we've developed in my research team that allow people in a very practical way to understand the structure of their beliefs and other people's beliefs. One is called cognitive effective mapping, uh, which is basically concept maps with emotions loaded in. They're very cool. And they, re they reveal a lot about how people view the world. Uh, and the second is called state space modeling or state space approach, which basically asks a series of questions like scale questions, like her questions about how you view the world, the basic characteristics of the world. And it allows you to position yourself ideologically in a large uh, conceptual space uh, relative to other people and see how distant you are from other groups and what the possibilities are for migrating towards each other and reaching some kind of consensus. And uh, both of these tools I think can help accelerate worldview change, uh, hopefully in a positive direction. And uh, there, I put them out there as sort of practical science that anybody can use. And there's some supporting software on, on, the, on the web. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I, the question, we had one question from still left from online that awareness, connectivity, knowledge are possible in the developed world but not really in the less developed countries. And so what are your thoughts on ensuring the future for all people on the planet? So we're walking yeah. away from. So I think the really big challenge is these extraordinary wealth gaps, right? Like close to 50% of the population, the world's population still lives on something like $3 or $5 a day or less, right? When I'm in my traveling in the developing world, I actually have, have come to a different conclusion that it's remarkable when you, you go to these distant places and with a backpack and in a bus somewhere in Africa. And you hear people are remarkably well connected into what's going on in the rest of the world. This connectivity, they may not have a smartphone in their pocket. They may not be on Google every day, but nonetheless, 
they are they still have the sense often for for this the the uh, the broader the broader human system, uh, not in the kind of detail we would have, but the connectivity is still there, which is one reason. I mean, I'm not kidding that half the world's population locked down in just a few weeks, and that was not just in wealthy countries. It was it was uh, substantially in poor countries too, as we know in India. Um, with some somewhat pernicious outcomes, effects in some ways. Um, a scientific understanding, of course, is weaker uh, in, in many of these places because of the lower levels of education, but people can see the consequences of climate change around them all over the planet now. And they understand that often that this is part of a broader set of processes. They have this intuition that this is not just local, that it's happening everywhere. Because, again, because of the information they're getting from being connected through, uh, through, through the web to information around the world. Um, whether the shared sense of shared fate will emerge. I mean, and maybe this is an interesting question on which to end our conversation. The, 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 human, the, the characteristic human response to situations of scarcity has been to divide up, to, to seal yourself within your in-group, your, 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 your identity group, to, uh, to uh, identify uh, out groups that are responsible for the challenges you're facing to dehumanize them and end up fighting. To, so the standard response to scarcity in the past in this kind of situation has been division and conflict uh, among societies. And that is by far the highest probability of where we're going to go in the future at the global level. But I hold out this possibility for the plasticity of human, human nature that we, we are in a, a sui generis situation this century that could actually force us to adapt in ways that we haven't adapted in the past. And, uh, and, and I think, <clears throat> and I think the, the litmus test for that is where, whether ultimately, if we do see ourselves as a collectivity on this planet, whether there is a genuine effort to raise the circumstances and improve the circumstances of that vast number of people on the planet who are uh, at, at, at much less advantage than we are in the West. You know, if we're really serious about this being a global projet de société, a global we, then we have to start looking out for each other. And that, that means there's a substantial responsibility on the part of those of us in the West to build, to build the capacity for uh, the poorer of those among us to flourish and prosper in the future. And right at the moment, that's very clearly under threat. Uh, in in, a, in this mindset of scarcity, so it's an open question whether whether uh, we're going to end up in that renew the future basin or not. Okay, um, yeah, that's a good place to stop because it's not completely pessimistic. We're going to hope that <laughs> that's positive. Um, hang on, I have to make sure. There we go. Um, so before we go, I want to invite everyone watching today to join our community on our website, uh, dialoguesanddemocracy.com to get email updates about our future events. And on our website, you'll see upcoming and past events. So this video will stay up. And we have an in the news page where we sort of go with what we're reading this week and we post articles that are interesting, uh, hopefully to the community uh, from across the spectrum in the international press. And we call attention to new books. So this book is, uh, right now up front and center. And there's also a link to support our work. Our next event is in two weeks on October 19th. Uh, we have Ruth Van Giat coming to Munich. So it will be an evening all about strongmen and authoritarian threats, uh, but it will also be online. Uh, so I look forward to seeing many of you out there uh, in person then. And I'd like to close tonight with a, a quote from the Atlantic Daily newsletter yesterday. Those of you who follow our website know that I'm a big fan of their journalism. And Tom Nichols addressed our current moment about what we can do in our everyday lives in the face of all of these challenges that we discussed tonight. And so I quote, he says, speak up, do not stay silent when our fellow citizens equivocate and rationalize, defend what is right, whether to a friend or a family member, refuse to laugh along with the flip cynicism that makes a joke of everything, Stay informed so that the stink of a death threat from a former president or the rattle of a nuclear saber from a Russian autocrat does not simply rush past you as if you've just driven by a sewage plant. None of this is easy to do, but we are entering a time of important choices, both at home, at the ballot box, so that's the midterms in America, 
and abroad on foreign battlefields. And the center, the confident and resolute defense of peace, freedom, and the rule of law must hold. So right now I'd like to thank the amazing behind the scenes team at America House for making this possible. Do you guys want to unmask and wave? There we go. Thank you. They keep uh, they keep all the tech stuff running. And uh, I'd like to thank again, David Anger and uh, Professor Homer Dixon. If people want to follow your work, Professor, could you tell us where to find you? The best place is to go to uh, uh, the Cascade Institute website. So that's cascadeinstitute.org, O-R-G. And uh, there's an enormous amount of information there uh, on a number of optimistic and positive projects, including new energy technologies. Super. Thank you very much for tonight. And thank you all for coming. Stay safe, everybody, and we'll see you in two weeks.